boot dev servers are down, our discords flooded with bug reports, and our inbox just won't shut up about the fact that you've got mail. And all because our backend servers couldn't serve static files at web scale. Okay, not really. We haven't had this exact problem at boot dev, though I have seen it at other companies I've worked on in the past. Not to say that we haven't had other issues. In this video, we're going to talk about how to sidestep this problem entirely. The problem of your server can't serve large media assets fast enough at high enough bandwidth to keep up with demand on the application. Now, even if your web application is just a little B2B SaaS application that allows marketers to synergistically align their OKRs with the interests of shareholders in a demanding online marketplace, if that's all it does, that's fine, but it still probably needs to serve large images and video files at scale, at least hopefully at scale if your company's doing well. 14 billion images are served every day across major social media platforms. And 5 billion videos are served daily, and that's just on YouTube. Your little JSON server that just sends bits of text back and forth across the internet doesn't hold a candle in terms of bandwidth scale to apps like Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. That's what media servers or large file servers or whatever you wanna call them, that's what they're optimized to do. Stream massive amounts of data across the internet. Take a look at this little JSON payload that my web application returns from a get users endpoint. This text only structure is a super simple way, very common way for web applications to send data back and forth from the front end to the back end across the internet. But you may have noticed something. That thumbnail URL, that's not an actual image. It's just a link to an image. So sure, I can add that image URL to an image tag in HTML and the browser will go fetch the actual image and display it to the user. But it's important to understand that my server, the one serving that JSON payload, it's not actually serving the image itself. It's just telling the browser where it can go find it. So if you're proud of the fact that your JSON API can handle 1000 requests per second, you might be ashamed to know that the typical image has 10 times the data payload of your typical JSON payload, and a video file is usually at least a thousand times larger. Now, of course, those are just estimates. So long story short, serving media, while it's typically pretty simple, we're just serving static files, it gets really hard at scale because of the amount of bandwidth and data involved. Now, sometimes it can be confusing whether or not a piece of data belongs in an architecture with a traditional database like Postgres or MySQL and a JSON API, or whether it belongs as a file with a file server. The way I like to think about it is if the data makes sense to store in an Excel spreadsheet, so think like username, email, link to image, then it probably belongs in your more traditional web application architecture traditional database, JSON API, JSON payloads. If the data is something that you'd store as its own standalone file on your file system, then you probably want to serve it with a file server of some sort. So things like PDF documents, images, videos, or rich text documents like Word documents. And as far as web server architecture goes, sometimes the same server that serves the JSON payloads or exposes the JSON API to the outside world, sometimes that same one will be a file server as well. It'll double up. For example, maybe slash API slash users returns a payload of JSON data that represents a user, while slash assets slash bear.jpg returns an image file. But sometimes the media server might be on a completely different machine or even on a serverless setup where you're using something like Amazon S3 Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob Storage to host all your media assets completely apart from your JSON API. And if you're going to use a managed media server and you're already on one of the large cloud providers like AWS, GCP, or Azure, then using their out of the box media server, or even if you're just using it for storage, is probably a really good decision. Yes, I'm talking about Amazon's S3 offering, Google's cloud storage, or Azure's blob storage. When you store a file on your hard drive, it's stored in a particular path. And that path is just a textual representation of where the file exists in the hierarchy of directories. The only thing stored in that file is the file itself. 
Other system metadata, stuff like the timestamp, right, when it was last modified, and permissions are actually stored in the file system, not the file. Okay, so what makes object or blob storage different? One important distinction is that in the object paradigm, file paths, they're not really nested within directories. In fact, directories are sort of just a namespacing illusion. Directories in an object storage system are really just a naming convention, a, a prefix on the key. The actual directory doesn't exist. You can't have an empty directory in one of these object storage systems. So an object's key is very similar to a file's path, and you can list everything with a specific key prefix, but it's, it's just not quite the same as there actually being a directory there. The other big difference is that the file's metadata, like permissions and when it was last modified, that kind of stuff is actually saved right alongside the object itself, not by the overarching file system. So why introduce this new paradigm at all? Did the cloud providers just need a new marketing term for their latest conference? Well, that might also be true, but there is an important technical distinction. Object storage was designed with distributed cloud storage in mind. Traditional file storage has a much harder time scaling across many different machines and many different servers. By making objects more self-encapsulated than files, and by using a flat namespace instead of a hierarchy of directories, it's easier to scale systems like AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, and Azure Blob Storage than it is to scale a traditional, say, Linux file system. The goal being to run these systems across thousands of servers in sometimes different data centers. See, if you're anything like me, you've probably engineered your application to handle its current levels of traffic, plus a little bit of extra wiggle room. And when I say a little, I'm probably exaggerating. I, I usually like my applications to be able to scale up to about 10 times their current load, anything less than that and I can't sleep at night. In other words, if I see a spike in traffic of like 5x over the next day, I just want my application to be able to handle it. I don't want to have to wake up in the middle of the night and manually scale nodes, turn on new pods, or add resources to my cluster. I want all that kind of stuff to be handled automatically in our current configuration. And by the way, before we move on, if you're enjoying this video and you want to see more of this stuff, please do like and subscribe. It really helps. Now, the nice thing about these managed services like S3 or cloud storage or blob storage is that they go big by default. As demand on your application grows, you're not going to be bottlenecked by S3. It's extremely unlikely that your application ever outscales the kind of scale that something like S3 can handle. Now, that doesn't mean that you never should roll your own file server, but the point is, if you do, it's much more likely that you'll have to overcome some of these scale hurdles on your own, as opposed to if you're working with one of these large providers. There's no guarantee that serving static files from your EC2 micro instance is going to be able to handle a 200x spike in traffic, but S3 will be able to handle that. Serverless was a really hot buzzword even before SST's lone marketer started making promotional videos. But usually whenever you hear someone talking about serverless, they're talking about AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions. The point being, they're talking about serverless compute. Serverless storage, on the other hand, was actually the first popular serverless offering. In fact, it's so popular and widely used that we barely even call it serverless anymore. I'm talking about AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob Storage, those types of storage offerings. In fact, if we listen to that SST guy again, he has a really great definition of the term serverless. For me, serverless pretty much means I'm paying for usage. Ideally, it scales to zero. So if I'm not using it, I'm paying zero. There's no like entry level cost. The more I use it, the more I pay. The less I use it, the less I pay. So by that definition, that it scales to zero and that you only pay for what you use, S3 is the perfect serverless offering, at least for storage. Now, there are a few benefits of these giant managed services using them for serverless storage. The first is massive scaling potential. It's very unlikely that your little app, I hope it's not that little, but it's very unlikely that your app is going to outscale the storage capabilities of something like S3. The second is availability. These massive cloud providers replicate their servers that run S3 and Google Cloud Storage and so on 
they replicate them across many data centers. So even if one data center goes down or someone unplugs a cable, there's backups. So the data stays available and ready to use with very high uptime percentages. On that note, due to them replicating the data across data centers or across availability zones within the same region, the data is redundant and backed up. So you don't have to worry about losing the data because of one corrupted hard drive. Another benefit is you have little to no maintenance to do on the servers. Again, this is why it's called serverless. You don't have to manage the AWS S3 or the Google Cloud Storage servers. Yes, they exist, but they're somebody else's problem. If you need to upgrade an operating system on one of those boxes, you need a new version of Nginx, that's not something that you have to worry about. And then another benefit is just because we're operating at such massive scale with these products, it's just frankly pretty cheap when you only have to store a few things. It can get expensive, especially when you need high bandwidth over time, but it's still probably cheaper than you doing it yourself. I mean, usage isn't that expensive on these massive cloud providers. In my mind, the biggest drawback is vendor lock-in. So it makes a lot of sense to me if you're already running on AWS or GCP or Azure to just go ahead and use their storage offering pretty good serverless offering, but it might not make sense to jump to AWS if you're hosted elsewhere just for S3. So vendor lock-in is always a concern, but it's also always a trade-off and not necessarily a bad thing. Now, as far as using one of these products, the big difference is you don't think about it as your server's local file system anymore, like you would with a traditional file server. S3's architecture is, I mean, you treat S3 as what it is, which is someone else's API. You make network requests to S3 when you want to upload or download files to it, and your application server interacts with it as an external server, not like a traditional server would, where it would just go to its local disk to read image and video files. When you're working with local media files, the only thing you have to worry about is the file path. Where is my program running? Where are the files that I want to serve on disk? Whether that's an absolute or a relative file path. When working with S3, it's similar, but there's now two things you have to worry about. There's the bucket and there's the key, which you could basically think about as a file path. Buckets are globally unique identifiers. So you usually just set up a bucket for your project or maybe your project might have multiple buckets if you've got a more sophisticated project that you're building. But then all you need is a key to be able to store and retrieve files. And this is typically done through your code, but one really cool part about these offerings is that when you add an object to one of these buckets and you make the bucket publicly accessible, someone can access your files directly through the API. In other words, S3 can be your media server. You don't need your server to proxy requests through to the bucket. You can let your application server worry about serving JSON. You can let S3 serve your media. Now, serving images really is pretty straightforward. You've got your S3 URL for the image, which again, acts as an HTTP file server. And then you've got an image HTML tag on the front end, and you're pretty much good to go. Now, there are some nuances, like if you're worried about DDoS attacks, or you need some more explicit routing or permission handling in front, of that static asset server, then you might use something like CloudFront or Cloudflare, but it will work technically as a image server out of the box. That said, serving video can be a little trickier. The problem is video is big. Your typical video is about a hundred times larger than your typical image, give or take a lot. And images are way bigger than plain text. A picture really is worth more than a thousand words, at least from a data perspective. So how are you able to stream hundreds of little videos every day if they take up so much data? And the answer is that you're probably not even downloading all of them. You're streaming them, and that's a big difference. See, downloading a file means asking for every last byte in the video file and not watching it until you have it all. We've all been there waiting for downloads. Streaming a file, on the other hand, means you're just asking for the next little bit of the file that you need so that you can immediately start watching it. And if you stop watching the video before you're done, you don't even use that extra bandwidth or that extra data. 
which is especially valuable if you're on a mobile connection. This is very important when you're trying to enslave an entire young generation into watching toilet content. These days, there's a ton of built-in technology that frankly makes streaming pretty easy for web developers. 20 years ago, getting streaming into your custom web app would have been a lot more work. And I don't mean that the technology under the hood is simple, I just mean it's a fairly well-defined problem. We stream lots of video these days, so as long as you're using the right tools, it's not rocket science to plug into your app. The most straightforward way to stream a video is probably to use a standard format like MP4 and make sure that the move atom is at the start of the file. And that really just means that you've encoded the file for streaming. And then on the client to use the HTML5 video tag. Of course, your web server, your standard file server, it needs to be smart enough to serve the MP4 file chunk by chunk. But again, if you're using a modern file server, this should just happen for you as long as the MP4 file is encoded properly. And with MP4, the reason that move atom needs to be at the beginning of the file is just because that bit of data is actually required for playback. So if it's at the back of the file, which it can be in some cases, the client won't be able to watch the video until it downloads the whole thing, which of course defeats the purpose of streaming. And of course, MP4 isn't the only file format for streaming. This isn't the only way to skin the cat. I mean, YouTube doesn't use MP4 files and they stream a lot of video. Where MP4 really starts to fall short, at least standard, traditional, flat MP4 files, is when you want adaptive streaming. You know when you've been watching a video and the quality drops for a bit and then maybe goes back up, it gets kind of fuzzy? That's because the video quality is being adapted to your network connections. You've probably also seen where you're watching Netflix and it starts out kind of fuzzy, but then goes higher resolution over time. That's because they don't want you to have to sit and wait for a higher quality stream, so they start you with something lower, and then as you're able to download more data, you'll get higher quality video. That's what more streaming optimized standards like MPEG Dash or HLS are for. So the good news is that serverless offerings like AWS S3 support HTTP range requests out of the box. So as long as your MP4 files are fast start encoded with that move atom at the front of the file, you should be good to go, at least for a basic streaming experience. You still won't be able to handle adaptive quality this way, you'd have to go to something else, but it will take care of a lot of simple use cases. So we've covered a lot of different stuff and really I just wanna wrap it all up and say, look, if you're needing to serve a lot of static assets, whether it's images, videos, PDF, Word documents, if it's static files that you need to serve, Offerings like S3, like Google Cloud Storage, like Azure Blob Storage, they're a really good option. Whether you serve directly from that bucket, like we've talked about, you proxy it through your own server. So user's request goes to your server, which then uses like the S3 API to retrieve and store images in S3 kind of behind the scenes. Either one of those things work. All this to say, if you're using S3 as a direct media server, in other words, you're serving images and videos directly out of S3, there are just a few things to consider. Number one, you might wanna throw something like CloudFront in front of S3. That's gonna give you a little bit more protection. It's gonna act as a caching layer. You'll be able to do more sophisticated permissioning at that layer than you would be just serving raw out of S3. Another thing to be careful of is you probably do not you almost certainly do not want to enable the list permission on a public S3 bucket. That'll allow users to see everything that you have in the bucket. Whereas if all you do is allow the get permission, it'll allow you to serve essentially that specific asset. And if someone wants a different asset, they'll need to know the exact URL of that asset. They won't be able to kind of paginate through all of the available objects in the bucket. I mean, someone could still DDoS you by requesting the same thing over and over again, but there's some caching involved. The point is you probably don't want them to be able to troll through all of your data. So I would just probably leave that off. And again, there's just always the concern that somebody could hit your S3 bucket directly, leading to large egress costs. So having something like a CDN in front or a proxy layer in front can minimize those concerns. We'll do a later video on CDNs and more advanced caching later. And if you just wanna know way more about all this stuff, about Amazon S3, about streaming, about building file servers, we do have a full course up on Boot Dev that you can go check out, it's fully interactive. You'll build your own little media server in Go using Amazon S3. That's there for you, link is in the description below. I'll see you in the next video.